Well, it's good to be with everybody this morning. Here's Margaret Henderson right in the house. We'll get to that in a minute, but I just, she's just sitting there back from the West Coast in a car for 6,000 miles of fun. Okay. All righty, folks. How many of you have had a garden or gardened before? How many of you are too lazy to garden? <laughs> Got you, bud. Got you in the back back there. You... Yeah, that's it. I, you didn't, I appreciate the sincerity of the confession if we're too lazy to garden. Well, if you know gardening, one of the greatest things you deal with is... Weeds, you, their weeds are such a problem, not just in gardens, but in lawns and flower beds, that if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, they have a whole wall dedicated to weed control. Like, they've got everything you could imagine. It kills this weed, not that weed, these weeds, not those weeds. It kills everything, obliterates the whole planet. I mean, you name it, they have it. You know, it's just there. And unfortunately, we've come to discover in hindsight that many of the things we've been putting on our fields and in our gardens for a long time probably wasn't so good for us. But I don't know if we can do anything about it, because apparently they're just there now, and we just kind of know it. And uh, this just is what it is. But bottom line is, uh, it's an example of trying to do a good thing so that something can flourish, right? And it inadvertently had a, a, a bad effect. This parable is kind of difficult because, you know, it points out so many different layers of the, what we call the human condition of our struggles as humans. We, in this parable, we see uh, a landowner who's probably very wealthy uh, because they have, they have a fair number of slaves who, who do their planting. Um, and putting that, uh, that aside for a moment, because obviously that comes uh, fret with all sorts of, of issues that we should address. But for the sake of the parable, we just know that this must be a big piece of land, given the number of, of servants and slaves that this master has. This tells us this is a very wealthy, well-to-do person. And he's planted wheat. And when you plant wheat, uh, there is a particular weed that can come up that looks just like weed when, it, when the seed heads appear. It's very hard to tell them apart until you go to pick them. Um, how many have planted wheat before? Shirley? Do you want to drive the tractor this week? I'm going to work on you. I'm going to come pick you up in the tractor. We own a tractor at the church that uh, I don't get to drive it as much anymore because Mr. Quick gets to drive it all the time. He's sitting back there. Uh, anyways, so how many people have grown wheat before? I'm sorry. I got off track there. Got off topic. Come on, man. I didn't know that about you. We're going to get a farm going on the back 22 here. All right, so if you plant wheat, there is a particular weed that comes up. I used to see it on my uncle's fields. You know, with a trained eye, you can tell it apart, but for an untrained eye, it looks very much like the wheat. It just is what it is. It was the same thing. We would, we would plant sorghum um, growing up, uh, and it would, there was weeds that would pop up in the sorghum that initially, until it turned brown, looked, very much like sorghum. So there's these weeds that imitate plants that you're trying to grow. And they can be very detrimental to your crop, but they're also very hard to get rid of uh, without obliterating the crop. Vanessa and I, uh, BK, so we have AK and BK, before kids, after kids. Before kids, we were able to go on a safari to South Africa, to Kruger National Park. And we went down there and if you've ever been on a safari before, one of the things that you do when you're on the safari is you learn about the environment uh, and how delicate it is. Not to be so cliche, but it very much is like the circle of life. How one little thing can cause ripple effects that you know, affect everything. I mean, this particular plant, it invades a particular area, hurts this animal, which hurts this animal, which then hurts this animal, this hurts the elephant, then hurts the lion. I mean, it just really is a, a reality. Like the, the things that happen have consequences and we were there one of the things that had happened at Kruger National Park there was this invasive grass that had moved into the savannas and they were trying to systematically remove it so they had a essentially a lease inside Kruger National Park about 80,000 hectares so 
big. And they were showing us. But to my eye, I got to thinking when I, they would say, see all those invasive grasses? And I would just see these beautiful grasses. And all I thought to myself is, why does my wife not see our walls like this, the way I see this grass? Because it looked perfect. Does Vanessa notice the invasive grasses? Of course. Does Vanessa notice if the paint color is just slightly off when I touch up? Of course. But the whole time I'm looking at these grasses, I'm going, how beautiful are the grasses? Vanessa's like, yeah, that's invasive. That's in-. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Okay. Anyhow, but what I learned is these grasses were uh, killing the native grasses that many of the animals depend upon, and the animals wouldn't eat a lot of these grasses. A couple would, but it was starting to have an effect on the food chain. So they were, as a company, one of the things they did is conservation. They would chase poachers, and they would do a lot of work on the ecosystem to keep it intact. So they were trying to go in and pull this grass. But I remember they got us out of the truck, our guide and our tracker, and they took us up to this patch of grass that Vanessa had x-ray vision on, and they showed me. And then up close, I could see it. It was just like the wheat farming. It was just like the weed I remember popping up. On the face of it, it looked just like the grass that was native. But then when you got in there, you saw what it was doing, how its roots invaded the grass next to it, how it would take over, choke, choke out plots of the grass. And it would kill. And then on its stock, it was subtle, but it was there. There was a distinct difference between the savanna grass and that grass. But from far away, it was hard to tell. And that's what makes this parable, this whole long story about wheat and weeds that y'all are going, where is he going with this? The whole point of that is to say, it's very hard to tell what's the good wheat and what's the bad wheat. And what the parable tells us after we even start to sort through this, that it's not our job to worry about what's the good wheat and what's the bad wheat or the weed. Actually, it tells us at the end of the age, at the end of the age, God will handle it. God will take care of it. God will square it away. We don't have to spend our lives judging everybody. But then we're left with a great question. We're like, so what do we do? Because we come from the age of instruction manuals, right? Everything has an instruction manual. Am I right? No? Have you bought anything from Ikea? The single worst instruction manuals on the planet. Amen? Can I get an amen on that? Amen, amen on Ikea. I hope y'all don't work for Ikea. I love Ikea. I love Ikea. But everything comes with an instruction manual. Literally yesterday, we got Linux a bubble maker. It's a little dragon. It has an on and off switch. It came with an instruction manual. Three instructions, take out of the box, which was funny because to get to the instruction manual, you already had to take it out of the box. Take it out of the plastic, hit the power switch. That was it. That was literally, it was a, and it was all, and then all the liability stuff on the back. So we're all left wondering, what are we supposed to do? So if we're not supposed to worry about what's the bad wheat and what's the good wheat, what's good and evil, because really there's no dualism, right? There's no dualism in creation. That's a heresy. There's no force equal to God. We like to lift up things. You know, we hear that phrase, and some of us may have said it, the devil made me do it. I used to tell my mom that all the time when I did something bad. The devil made me do it. I thought that would get me out of it. And, and mama would look at me and go, the devil did not make you do that. You made you do that. That's right, Shirley, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The reality is there's not a dualism. Anytime Jesus appears, think about the story of the man possessed by a legion of demons. When Jesus shows up, is there some cosmic battle? No. The the demons, a legion of demons, looks at Jesus, the fullness of light, the fullness of love, the fullness of hope, and says, what will you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? There's no cosmic battle. And of course, Jesus sends them into the swine. And that's what God is. God is the fullness of life. Evil is a permeation of the good. And all of us are capable of very evil things. And even when we have good intentions, sometimes those have repercussions that affect other people. And that's part of what we live in. And that's part of what this parable addresses, that even though we sometimes wonder why good things happen to bad people, or we have these great questions about where God is in the chaos, what this parable reminds us of, that in the chaos that is this world, in the chaos that was first century 
Palestine in the time of Matthew's gospel, that the world was not that different than ours and that God was constant, that God was faithful, that God was just encouraging people to live out the good news, to be a place where God happens for somebody else. So the instruction manual is simple. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. It's shorter than the doggone bubble maker. You don't even have to take it out of the box. You don't have to take it out of the plastic. Love God and love your neighbor. We might take that a step further to say, pray daily. Talk to God. Talk to God like you talk to your best friend. How many people call their best friend every day? Thank you. A lot of us call our best friend. How many of you call your best friend three times a week? Or do you have a best friend? <laughs> All right, let me, actually, let me, maybe it's a generational thing. How many of you text your best friend every day? There we go. All right, that makes up for the deficit. Now, don't raise your hand on this. This is not meant to be a guilt thing. But how many of you take time every day to talk to God? You didn't have to raise your hands. It's not meant to guilt people. The bottom line is, if we're honest, we probably spend more time in relationships with our friends than we do spending time cultivating a relationship with God who longs to be the best, best friend of our lives. And that's just something we should work on. That's the instruction manual. Step one, pray daily. Step two, spend time with Scripture. But don't worry if you don't understand it. This whole world we live in where we're supposed to understand Scripture that's supposed to be so clear, it ain't clear. And in this room, I see about, trying to guess for communion, 180 different interpretations of what the Scripture might say. And that's okay. We learn to love each other in disagreement. We wrestle with Scripture together. We see it as revealing God because I bet If I were to ask, don't raise your hand. Some of you have probably read a passage of Scripture. You have something going on in your life, and it spoke to you differently than the first time you read it or the time before that or the time before that. That's what Scripture does. It's revelatory. Spend time in Scripture. And last but not least, spend time with the community of the faithful. Spend time here. Spend time in the body. Because our whole God job is not to worry about what the bad weed is, not to root it out. We, of course, and Matthew's gospel is clear, oppressive evil. When we see people marginalized, people cast out, people under great duress and threat, we bring the love of the gospel. That's like the weeds that are obvious in your garden. Those are the ones you know are going to choke every plant out, and they don't look anything like anything else, and you pull those out. Matthew's gospel is full of examples of Jesus encouraging us to that. But this other kind of evil that falls away, these permeations of good that we fall into the trap of, what we refer to as sin, we don't necessarily need to worry about everybody's sin. What we need to worry about is are we reflecting God's love in our life? Can people find God in us? Are we spending time showing people what selflessness is in a world that can be increasingly selfish? Are we showing what it looks like to serve? Are they going to find us? Are they going to find the story of God? in a world that has a lot of tribalism, where everybody's building their little communities of agreement, and the gospel comes and obliterates these false walls we put around ourselves. How do we live into that so that everybody sees the light of God in our lives? This is a simple thing. Pray, read scripture, stay with the body of the faithful, go out and share the good news. Be a place where God happens for somebody else. And God will take care of the rest. Amen.